Well, that's kind of an obvious statement up there. I started with that sentence about 12 years ago, and I started in the context of developing countries. But you're sitting here from every corner of the world. So if you think of a map of your country, I think you'll realize that for every country on Earth, you could draw little circles to say, these are places where good teachers won't go. On top of that, those are the places from where trouble comes. So we have an ironic problem. Good teachers don't want to go to just those places where they're needed the most. I started in 1999 to try and address this problem with an experiment, which was a very simple experiment in New Delhi. I uh, basically embedded a computer into a wall of a slum in New Delhi. Um, the children barely went to school. They didn't know any English. They'd never seen a computer before. And uh, they didn't know what the internet was. I connected high-speed internet to it. It's about three feet off the ground. Turned it on and left it there. After this, we noticed a couple of interesting things which you'll see. But I repeated this all over India and then through a large part of the world and noticed that children will learn to do what they want to learn to do. This is the first experiment that we did. Eight-year-old boy on your right teaching his student, a six-year-old girl, and he was teaching her how to browse. This boy here in the middle of central India, this is in a Rajasthan village where the children recorded their own music and then played it back to each other. And in the process, they enjoyed themselves thoroughly. They did all of this in four hours after seeing the computer for the first time. In another South Indian village, these uh, boys here had assembled a video camera and were trying to take the photograph of a bumblebee. They had downloaded it from Disney.com or one of these websites 14 days after putting the computer in their village. So at the end of it, we concluded that groups of children can learn to use computers and the internet on their own, irrespective of who or where they were. At that point, I became a little more ambitious and decided to see what else could children do with a computer. We started off with an experiment in Hyderabad, India, where I gave a group of children, they spoke English with a very strong Telugu accent. I gave them a computer with a speech-to-text interface, which you now get free with Windows, and uh, asked them to speak into it. So when they spoke into it, uh, the computer typed out gibberish. So they said, well, it doesn't understand anything of what we are saying. So I said, yeah, I'll leave it here for two months. Make yourself understood to the computer. So the children said, how do we do that? And I said, uh, well, I don't know, actually. And I, <laughs> <laughs> and I left. <laughs> Two months later, and this is now documented in the uh, Information Technology for International Development Journal, their accents had changed and were remarkably close to the neutral British accent in which I had trained the speech-to-text synthesizer. In other words, they were all speaking like James Tooley. <laughs> so, so you can, uh, they could do that on their own. After that, I started to experiment with various other things that they might learn to do on their own. Um, I got an interesting phone call once from Colombo, from the late Arthur C. Clarke, who said, I want to see what's going on. And he couldn't travel, so I went over there. He said two interesting things. A teacher that can be replaced by a machine should be. The, se <laughs> <laughs> the second thing he said was that if children have interest, then education happens. And I was doing that in the field, so every time I would watch it and Think of him. Possible. And uh, they can undoubtedly uh, help people because the children very quickly learn to navigate the web and find things which interest them. And when you've got interest, then you have education. I took the experiment to South Africa. This is a 15 year old boy. This is my chin. I play games like, like animals. And I, I'm, I listen to music. And I asked him, uh, do you send emails? And he said, yes, and they hop across the ocean. This is in Cambodia, rural Cambodia. 
a fairly silly arithmetic game, which no child would play inside the classroom or at home. They would, you know, throw it back at you. They'd say, this is very boring. If you leave it on the pavement, and if all the adults go away, then they will show off with each other about what they can do, which is what uh, these children are doing. They're trying to multiply, I think. And all over India, at the end of about two years, children were beginning to Google their homework. As a result, the teachers reported tremendous improvements in their English. <laughs> you know, rapid improvement in all sorts of things. They said they've become really deep thinkers and so on and so forth. <laughs> and, uh, and indeed, they had. I mean, if, if there's stuff on Google, why would you need to stuff it into your head? So at the end of the next four years, I decided that groups of children can navigate the internet to achieve educational objectives on their own. At that time, a large amount of money had come into Newcastle University um, to improve schooling in India. So Newcastle gave me a call. I said, I'll do it from Delhi. They said, there's no way you're going to handle a million pounds worth of uh, you know, university money um, uh, sitting in Delhi. So uh, in 2006, I bought myself a heavy overcoat and moved to Newcastle. <laughs> I wanted to test the limits of this system. The first experiment I did out of Newcastle was actually done in India, and I set myself an impossible target. Can Tamil-speaking 12-year-old children in a South Indian village teach themselves biotechnology in English on their own? And I thought, I'll test them. They'll get a zero. I'll give them material. I'll come back and test them. They'll get another zero. I'll go back and say, yes, we need teachers for certain things. I called in 26 children. They all came in there. And I told them, look, there's some really difficult stuff on this computer. I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't understand anything. Um, it's all in English, and uh, I'm, I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> so I left them with it. I came back after two months, and the 26 children marched in looking very, very quiet. I said, well, did you look at any of the stuff? I said, yes, we did. Did you understand anything? No, nothing. So I said, well, how long did you practice on it before you decided that you understood nothing? I said, we look at it every day. So I said, for two months, you were looking at stuff you didn't understand. So a 12-year-old girl raises her hand and says, literally, apart from the fact that improper replication of the DNA molecule causes genetic disease, we've understood nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> took me three years to publish that. It's just been published in the British Journal of Educational Technology. One of the referees who refereed the paper said, it's too good to be true, <laughs> which was not very nice. <laughs> well, one of the girls had taught herself to become the teacher, and uh, that's her over there. Remember, they don't study English. Where is it? Where, where is it? Neuron? I've edited out the last bit where she said, when I asked, where is the neuron? And she says, the neuron, the neuron. And then she looked and did this. <laughs> but her expression was not very nice. So, <laughs> so their scores had gone up from 0 to 30%, which is an educational impossibility under the circumstances. But 30% is not a pass. So I, I found that they had a friend, a local accountant, a, a young girl, and they played football with her. I asked that girl, would you teach them enough biotechnology to pass? And she said, how would I do that? I don't know the subject. I said, no, use the method of the grandmother. She said, what's that? I said, well, what you've got to do is stand behind them, and admire them all the time. <laughs> Just say to them, that's cool, that's fantastic, what is that? Can you do that again? Can you show me some more? She did that for two months. The scores went up to 50, which is what the posh schools of New Delhi with a trained biotechnology teacher were getting. So I came back to Newcastle with these results and decided that there was something happening here that definitely was getting very serious. 
So having experimented in all sorts of remote places, I came to the most remote place that I could think of. <laughs> Across the River Tyne, 5,000 miles from Delhi, is the little town of Gateshead. In Gateshead, I took 32 children, and I started to, to fine-tune the method. I made them into groups of four. I said, you make your own groups of four. Each group of four can use one computer, and not four computers. Remember, from the hole in the wall. You can exchange groups. You can walk across to another group if you don't like your group, etc. You can go to another group, peer over their shoulders, see what they're doing, come back to your own group, and claim it as your own work. And I explained to them that you know, a lot of scientific research is done using that method. <laughs> <laughs> The children enthusiastically got after me to say, now what do you want us to do? I, I gave them six GCSE questions. The first group, the best one, solved everything in 20 minutes. The worst, in 45. They used everything that they knew. News groups, Google, Wikipedia, Ask Jeeves, etc. The teachers said, is this deep learning? I said, well, let's try it. I'll come back after two months. We'll give them a paper test, no computers, no talking to each other, etc. The average score when I'd done it with the computers and the groups was 76%. When I did the experiment, when I did the test after two months, the score was 76%. There was photographic recall inside the children, I suspect because they're discussing with each other. A single child in front of a single computer will not do that. I have further results which are almost unbelievable of scores which go up with time. Because their teachers say that after the session is over, the children continue to Google further. I went to Turin in May. I sent all the teachers away from a group of 10-year-old students. I speak only English, they speak only Italian. So we had no way to communicate. I started writing English questions on the blackboard. The children looked at it and said, what? I said, well, do it. They typed it into Google, translated it into Italian, went back into Italian Google. 15 minutes later, <laughs> next question, where is Calcutta? This one, they took only 10 minutes. I tried a really hard one then. Who was Pythagoras and what did he do? There was silence for a while. Then they said, you've spelled it wrong. It's Pythagora. <laughs> and then, in 20 minutes, the right angle triangles began to appear on the screen. So it just sent shivers off my spine. These are 10 year olds. <laughs> So you know what's happened? I think we've just stumbled across a self-organizing system. A self-organizing system is one where a structure appears without explicit intervention from the outside. Self-organizing systems also always show emergence, which is that the system starts to do things which it was never designed for, which is why you react the way you do, because it looks impossible. I think I can make a guess now. Education is a self-organizing system where learning is an emergent phenomenon. It will take a few years to prove it experimentally, but I'm going to try. But in the meanwhile, there is a method available. One billion children, we need 100 million mediators, there are many more than that on the planet, 10 million souls, $180 billion, and 10 years. We could change everything. Thanks. <laughs>